we are going to begin looking at the word uh, what the Lord will have us discuss, the Son of God. Can we just uh, bow our heads and say a word of prayer as we move into understanding the sons of God? Father, I want to thank you and give you praise for this moment. We have prayed for over three months preparing for this meeting. And Lord Jesus Christ, the committee have prayed the church have prayed, individuals have prayed. We want to join hands one more time to say, Father, send revival. We are asking and say, Father, change our hearts. Renew our thinking. Give us a deeper understanding of the word. And Lord, help us to work with you the way you want it. Father, we want to thank you because we know you are here. And you will, just, you will do just what you have planned to do in the name of Jesus. Blessed be your holy name, Jehovah. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. And so I want to begin by establishing for us the perspective of the sons of God. We have called ourselves children of God, sons of God, and I just feel that I remind us about it and give us a picture of how the Lord has opened my eyes to understand it for this week. And the first is to establish and share with us that let's assume we have a human father who has a son or a daughter that is a criminal, that is stubborn, that is not doing well. So time and again, the police will arrest him. And the father will go to the police station. And when the father goes to the police station, he's going to bail his son or his daughter back home. Am I correct? Now, but by the time the father frees his son or his daughter from the police station, the father is not going to sit with the daughter or the son and say, you are not going to steal again. I will take you to the office. I will take you to the market on, so that you don't steal. No, the son is going to be free to continue living. For some reasons, if the child is not changed, he or she will steal again. And he may return to the police station. Then the father will go and rescue again. Say, I have done this. This is a third time. In fact, sometimes the father will say, I'm not going anywhere this time around. But two, three days later, he will have to go and say, please, he's my son. And he will free him. This is the picture I want you to get in your mind that was happening with the children of Israel in the book of Judges. And so in the book of Judges, we read how Israel will be in captivity to the Midianites. Then the Lord will deliver them. And after some time, they will sin against God again. And the Bible says he will hand them over to the Syrians and then they will capture them. And they will say, oh, Father, we are sorry. And then he will deliver them. And they will sin again. That is a picture of God's deliverance in the Old Testament for the people of Israel. So they sin. And then he hands them over to the enemy. And then he delivers them and brings them back again into the land of Canaan. And then they will sin again tomorrow. You know, so it was a continual saving and sinning. Saving, punishment, deliverance, you know, repentance, sinning, saving. And it, it was just a cycle. I, I am not there in the Godhead. I am not in heaven. But somehow in my mind, I have a feeling that when God decided right from Genesis in the second plan of our salvation, and he said, we will send a savior for the salvation of man. The Trinity sat and looked at it and said, how long will we continue to save man? And then man will go back to sin. And then we'll go and save him. He said, can we save him once and for all? Can we do something to change the dynamics of going to police station every day? Or going to Satan to deliver our children. So that was the Trinity plan to save man. And when Trinity sat and decided that, 
Nobody knew. Nobody understood the plan. It wasn't announced. It was hidden. And so it's a mystery. Anything that is hidden, something that God keeps to himself, something that God doesn't permit people to see easily, is a mystery. So the coming of Jesus Christ was a mystery to save man once and for all. Amen. And of course, that mystery was hidden even from prophets and from Satan. And so prophets were prophesying the coming of Christ, but they didn't even know that kind of salvation. What will it look like? How will it be? And the people of Israel then, when Jesus Christ came, the Bible was telling us that they were longing and waiting for the coming of the Messiah. You know, they were waiting. They, they were looking forward to it. <laughs> Amen. So a drama happened. Um, I, want to, I want to do a drama. Uh, do your best to, to see me. You know, I have some blockage with um, uh, the speakers, but don't worry about it. I'll try to move. But, but I'm going to stage a drama to help us see when Jesus came, what happened. Amen. Amen. So when Jesus left heaven and came to humanity, He was born and Satan, every time Satan saw Jesus Christ, he knew Jesus as the son of God when Jesus was still in heaven. Is someone with me? So when Satan saw Jesus on earth, he knew he was the son of God because he had seen him in heaven. And so, Satan tried to kill him when he was young. But that didn't happen. There was an escape plan. Then, when Jesus was to start ministry and was fasting, he came to say, if, if you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread now. Not because he didn't know he was the son of God, but it was temptation. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. There were times also that Jesus came and Satan had, had you know, um, uh, possessed a madman that was cutting himself with stones. And when he says, son of David, why have you come to destroy? And Jesus commanded him, keep quiet. And he said, get out of them. So, so Satan knows Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus will always reveal himself to Satan as the son of the living God. Amen. Satan cannot touch the son of God. Satan cannot do anything to the son of God. And because of that, whenever humans pass away, or we die. The Bible in the Old Testament tells us that the soul that sin shall what? Shall die. So I want you to picture a council. There is a council of, of heavenly beings where God superintends. So when a man sins, when a man dies, sorry, Satan goes and says, Aha, uh -huh, this man dies. His name is Ahab. His soul is guilty of the sin. I have come to demand for him. And he say, oh, yes, Ahab, actually. Then he will take. So, every soul that dies is either Satan claims it or God claims it, depending on the person's righteousness. Are we together here? And it was in a council. I want you to picture a council where every soul that perishes, you go to that council and make a defense that it belongs to you and then you take it or you leave it for God. Little wonder in Jude we read how Satan and Angel Michael struggled on the body of who? Moses. So I want you to have that mind. And that has been happening until Jesus Christ came. 
So Jesus Christ kept working on his plan. Kept working on his plan. When Jesus was ready to go to the cross, until when Jesus was ready to die for humanity, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 21, he said, he who knew no sin became. Now, I want you to take note of this. He did not take the sin. He became sin. Praise God. So, when Jesus Christ became sin for us, he now went to Satan. And Satan had man to go and execute. And for the first time when Jesus Christ approached the devil, the devil saw Jesus as sin. And he says, release man and take me. I will want to die in his place. Two things. That, that scenario was to lure Satan to accept the bargain. And that scenario is also so that Jesus will triumph in victory. So Satan saw Jesus as sin. And he released man and said, why not? Ah, Jesus, you? Because all this while when he sees Christ, he sees the son of God. But for the first time in his life, he saw Jesus as sin. Not carrying our sin, but he became sin. He released man and said, go. Jesus, come. So he bundled him. He took him and all the story from Pilate to Herod and the rest of it. Crucify him. And by the time he nailed him to the cross, it was a victory. Yes. 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 Ha, finally. When Jesus died, Satan went to the council to demand the soul of Christ. So imagine the council sitting again. And Jesus and Satan came. He said, God, I have come for the soul of Jesus. We crucified him. And I saw him as sin. So we have come for it. So they looked and looked and said, Ah, Jesus. Of Nazareth, he said, yes. You want his soul, he said, yes. He said, but from every evidence, every evidence, Jesus Christ lived as a human being but has never sinned one day. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. He said, we, this soul that's, that you have come for has never sinned for one day. He said, no, I saw him. I saw him sin. He said, wow. The sin he died for was not his own. So Satan lost the battle. And Jesus, could, Jesus' soul could not be given to him. This is where the thing gets better. When Satan discovered he cannot have Christ, he said, no. The man I release, let me go and claim him back. Because, ah, this is a trick. So he ran to catch man. Man, meanwhile, after his release, believed in Jesus. John chapter 1 and verse 12. To them who receive him, as many that believe in his name, he gave the right to become sons of God. So when Satan came back, man had become the son of God. So when he came, he saw the son of man as the son of God. And he said, hi, I can't touch him. I can't touch him. Then he ran back again to go and say, ah, this thing is fraudulent. This is not right. Oh, this is inconclusive. <laughs> Amen. Huh? You are laughing. Are you people inconclusive? So when he ran to come back, the three days that Jesus died, he went into hell. And the Bible says in Psalms, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. 
Who is this king of glory? The Lord God Almighty. So Jesus released all the prisoners from, from Adam till his time. Before Satan came back. And he came and saw everybody chainless, redeemed, released. That's why when the Bible was saying, okay, when the Bible was saying in the book of Colossians chapter 2, 13 and 15, I would want us to read that, please. Colossians chapter 2, 13 to 15. If you have it, someone with a mic, can we just read that aloud? And you who were dead in your trespasses mm. and the uncircumcision of your flesh, yes. God made alive together mm. with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses yes. by canceling the record of death mm. that stood against us mm. with its legal demands. Yes. This he set aside, mm. nailing it to the cross. Uh -huh. He disarmed the rulers and authorities oh. and put them to shame by yes. triumphing over them in him. Amen. This he put to public disgrace. There are some other versions they say that he put Satan to public disgrace yeah. and disarmed him, giving us salvation. So here is a statement. Here is a statement I would like to leave with you, a quotation. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men will become the sons of God. The Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men will become the sons of God. And that was how we became sons. And from that time on, it's not a negotiation anymore that when man sin, God will go and deliver him. Man will fail and then he will go like, 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 like what's happening in the olden days. No. There is now a salvation that is permanently secured in the hand of Christ. And he said, to those that you have given me, no one can snatch them from my hands. A permanent place to help you and I understand. You are now a son. Hallelujah. Let me quickly add at this point so that my mothers and my sisters will not think by us. And for as many that must have read scriptures that is feminist, you have a different thinking. When the Bible says we are sons of God, he wasn't talking about gender. It's not sons and daughters of God in the light of John 1.12. No. Every born again Christian is a son. Why? Because sonship connotes inheritance in the kingdom. Are you with me? So it's not about your gender. It's about saying whether male or female, we are sons of God. Because we are co-heirs with Jesus and we have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. So you are a son of God. Hallelujah. You are a what? Son of God. All of us are sons of God. There are some key things that actually helps us to see it's not about gender. So when you read a Bible that are saying that, that rewrite or reconstruct John 1.12 and they are saying that eh, eh, this one is you are sons and daughters of God. It's really, the people don't understand scriptures. They're the interpreters. Because permit me to also bring this uh, side by side. Jesus Christ calls us his bride. We are the bride of Christ. Am I correct? Uh -huh. Did he say women are bride and men are groom of Christ? Can, whether you are a man or a woman, you are a bride to Christ. Because brideship connotes you have a spiritual womb and you can give birth. Amen. So being a bride of Christ has nothing to do with gender. Being the son of God has nothing to do with gender. 
and we'll look at the bride tomorrow. But coming back to understanding the son, when Jesus secured our place as sons of God, Now when we became when we became the sons of God or the son of God there's something you need to understand there are terminologies or keywords that scripture refers to the children of God one is that because you are the son of God you are a saint you are a priest and you are an ambassador amen amen yes so you are the son of God and in that concept you are a saint, you are a priest and you are an ambassador. You see, let me, let me bring us to a knowledge here. When you became the son of God, nobody mediated between you and God. Is someone with me? Meaning, your becoming the son of God was done and accomplished by God. There is no pastor in between. There is no denomination in between. There is no, I also added it, Christian Association of Nigeria in between. See, they have no hand in how you became the son of God. I, I, I mentioned and I said, even the person that led you to Christ did not mediate your coming to Christ. He or she was a tool used by God to help you see and know the way. And that's why it's your true confession that Christ stepped in and made you his son. Hallelujah. On that ground, I would want to say that since nobody sat in the council of the Trinity to approve your being the son of God, nobody can pronounce you out of it. Amen. Since nobody sat in a council to determine that you will be the son of God, nobody can pronounce you out of it. A word that is not too common in Equa, which is evangelical Protestant, but very common in Catholics and um, um, Methodists and Anglican, you know, especially even in the early days is excommunication. And uh, it's, a, it's a church, is the highest form of church discipline. If you have done some studies, you will hear that word. You know, so, but as, as a body of Christ, we meet together and the body supervised and led by the reverend and the associate, this is a body of Christ that for some reason, someone can be in error and the church will call the person to order. And if it warrants it, the church can put the person in a discipline. Are we together? I want to just help you see so that we can strike a balance. It's possible that it's a, a matter can happen that the church is not fully in the picture of what has happened and you are in a church discipline. Are you with me? Then also, as a child of God, when you offend God, when you sin, and you return to God for forgiveness, God forgives, cleanses, and washes you. The period you may be in church discipline, 
does not negate that you are not the son of God. Is somebody with me here? So, so I, I just want you to see and understand that when, when you sin and you come and say, Daddy, I, I have wronged God. This is it. And you mention it. Your confession to God restores you. Even if the church setting is saying, we'll put this one in discipline, this is going to be like this, 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 you are settled with God. Amen. Why am I bringing this? Is to help us see a situation that Martin Luther was. There is a reformer called Martin Luther. And Martin Luther challenged the church because at that time what was happening was so terrible. So terrible that in those days Pope Leo X will print a paper and sell to believers as salvation. It is called indulgence. If you buy that paper is your salvation. The Roman Catholic sold a piece of paper in the name of indulgence. And so a priest discovered and said, ah, this is a wrong teaching. They are teaching them that you are going to be saved by works. You have to do this, do that before you can be saved. In fact, at that time, Believers were not permitted to read the Bible. But when this priest, God opened his eyes and he saw that salvation is by grace, not by works, he started challenging the Pope. He challenged the Catholic authority to the point that when he was called to defend himself, at some point, the Roman Catholic Church pronounce him, you know, as excommunicated, removed from communion. But because he was innocent and he was doing the right thing, that did not take him away from his sonship. I am mentioning this because part of what we are going to be looking at going forward, you gave me a difficult topic, sir. Revival. No, when you talk about revival, you are talking about challenging what is wrong so that we can return to the right path. Amen. That's revival. And so, we are going to be looking at something that will challenge our personal life and how we have done it wrongly and what God is calling us to do rightly. We are also going to be challenging our denomination, Equa, about things we have done wrongly that we need to return to do the right thing. If we must have revival, then we must speak the truth and we must see things that are not the way they used to be and return to it. That's revival. And so I am saying this because that is the path God is going to take us through. That is what God is going to be opening our eyes into these few days by the special grace of God. And I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. This is going to be my last point for the day. And then we'll close with a word of prayer. John 15, 16. Please, Brother Ben, read that for us again. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but, chose, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Amen. Amen. John fifteen sixteen says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that ye may go and bring forth fruits and that your fruits shall remain. That whatsoever ye ask of the Father 
in my name, he may give it to you. Earlier on, I had mentioned that when you become the son of God, you are a saint. What's the second one? A priest. The last one, an ambassador. Please follow me carefully. Every one of us, by believing in Jesus, Jesus told his disciples. Now, in verse 15, in verse 15 of John 15, the Bible says, Until now, I have called you servants. But now, I call you friends. Why? Because I have revealed to you everything my father showed me. And then he went further to say, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So, you are a saint because God chose you. You didn't deserve to be a saint. None of us deserved it. When we talk about saints, you see, and that was where the Roman Catholics also got it wrong. Because in the Roman Catholic Church, as a priest, you have to do certain service and grow, and, and you reach a point that you will now be called a saint, meaning you don't have sin. Are you with me? So you are holy, you have done something. And that's why we have the Saint Matthew, Saint Peter, Saint uh, Mary. Um, uh, let me see. Is uh, cap federal capital is Bagi now? Uh -huh. Shokolo. We don't have Saint Shokolo or Saint Ibrahim. Are you or Saint Dixon? Are you getting me? It is saying you have to attain a kind of righteousness before the church will pronounce you a saint. But that is wrong and it's not biblical. The reason why you and I are saints is because God chose us. Everyone seated here, if you have believed in Jesus, you are a saint. You don't need a church to pronounce you a saint because God has pronounced you, you are. He said, you did not choose me I chose you. So our choosing is to sainthood. The second is, then I ordained you. Some other versions say, I appointed you. Amen. I ordained you or I appointed you. So the second thing is ordination. The word ordination or the process of ordination was done by Jesus Christ. Every believer in Christ is ordained as a priest. In the Old Testament, only the family of Aaron are priests. Is somebody with me? The rest of the tribe of Levi serve in the temple. But only members in the family of Aaron can become priests. So when Jesus Christ was coming to change the priesthood of Aaron, the Levitical people, back to the priesthood of Christ in the order of Melchizedek, he did not come through the tribe of Levi, he came through the tribe of Judah. To tell Israel that it's not just a tribe, I am now working with the kingdom. So Jesus Christ came and changed it. Every believer in Christ is ordained as a priest. Let me help you see and understand this. Because sometimes we know it here, but we don't accept it here. Uh -uh. I am not saying it's because of you. I know how we feel because I was in that position before. Reverend O.J. has been ordained. 
Am I correct? Our Reverend Daddy Ibrahim has been ordained. Am I correct? Permit me to say at this point, every denominational ordination is reordination. The first ordination they received was from Jesus. See, you had God's grace before Equa understood you and gave you reverend. It was not the day that pastors gathered to ordain you that you were ordained. They saw God's ordination in your life and ordained you. Because Jesus has ordained every one of us as priests. Whether it is recognized by a denomination or not, you are ordained. Is someone with me? Until you discover that value in your life, you will live your life substandard. You won't live your life to the full operating as a servant of God. Jesus said, when I called you, I ordained you. Hallelujah. And so every Christian is ordained as a priest to go and live his life. The last point is say, and that you may go and what? Bear fruits. Fruit that will abide. And what does that mean? I am sending you as an ambassador. Every believer is sent as an ambassador to go and bear fruit. The mistake you and I will make is to say, ah, when they say go, is for evangelists, is for missionaries, is for uh, the, me, my gift is uh, praying or singing. Scripture is telling the disciples, I ordained you and I sent you to go and bear fruits, fruits that will last. That's our ambassadorial task or commissioning by God. And Jesus did it in our lives. We need to leave that as our calling. Sons of God are saints. And a saint is having right standing in God's presence. Sons of God are priests. And a priest is having the right to serve on God's altar. Every son of God is an ambassador. And an ambassador is having the right to represent God in the nations. That is who you are. That is who I am. Jesus said it. If you believe it, it is so. Hallelujah. And that's our calling to Christianity. We need to therefore open up and be able to say, God, have your way in my life. I am a saint. I'm a priest. I'm an ambassador. I am the son of God. We're going to pray. And this evening as we pray together, I'm going to pray with two categories of people. You may be seated here and you are saying, so I have been carrying the ordination of God on me and I did not know. I want to pray with that category of people to say, I am discovering that in me is a saint, in me is a priest, in me is an ambassador, but I have not lived it. I didn't know. We'll pray together. Please, the band, you can just come up. And the second category we are going to be praying with is from now henceforth, I will live my life upon the revelation of the truth of my sonship in Christ Jesus. Let's have a revival from the pulpit to the pew. Let's have a revival. That starts with me and you. 
then reaches out to the lost and hungry world and bring them in. This is our joy. It's our survival. Let's pray for the Holy Ghost arrival. Let's have a revival. Let's have a revival. Let's have a revival That starts with me and you And reaches out to the lost and hungry world To bring them in This is our joy It's our survival Let's pray for the Holy Ghost arrival Let's have a revival. Let's have a revival. From the pulpit to the pew. Let's have a revival. Let's start with me and you. Let's start with me and you. Let it reach us out. Let it reach us out to the lost and hungry world. And bring them in. This is our joy. Are you seated here and you want to say, Heavenly Father, I discover I have something in me that I have not used. I have been a saint, but I have lived in fear. I have been a priest, but I have lived like a common Israelite. I have been an ambassador, but I didn't live my life to shine as an ambassador. Father, I want it to change tonight. You want to pray that prayer? Be on your feet. Let's pray together. You want to say, Heavenly Father, have your way. Just be on your feet and we'll pray together, wherever you are. The Lord bless you. You're standing to the Lord. Please, as soon as you stand, just commit it to the Lord. Say, Father, thank you for this revelation. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for what you have done. I know I'm a saint. I know I'm a priest. I know I'm an ambassador, and I want to leave it out. And the Lord will reach out to you. The Lord bless you. Just start praying. Just pray and commit that to the Lord. Father, we thank you. God, we exalt you. God, we exalt you. Heavenly Father, we want to pray with these brothers that God, your name, be exalted and be praised in their lives. Thank you, Jesus, for this commitment and their realization that God, they didn't know what they have. But now that you have revealed to them, oh God, they are owning up to say, Lord Jesus, use it. Lord Jesus, help me to leave it out. Father, I pray that God, you will honor their prayer in the name of Jesus. You will strengthen and guide them. And you will use them mightily to the praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. The second and last group will be praying. Is you have come to this realization and you're saying, from now henceforth, I will fully live my life upon the revelation of the truth that I am the Son of God. Nothing's going to hinder me. I understand I'm a Son of God. I understand I'm a priest of the Lord. I will live a full life of serving the Lord. Please, you want to be on your feet so we can pray together. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. As you stand, just say, Father, have your way. Father, take control. I want to live to the fullest of this revelation in my life. I want to live to the fullest of this revelation in my life, in my workplace, in my home, in my community, in the church, that God's name be glorified. Thank you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for these ones who are standing. 
I ask, Lord Jesus, that God, you take all the glory and honor. They are asking the Lord they will live to the fullest by the special grace of God in their lives, this revelation of their sonship. Father, help them. Wherever they have seen a weakness, oh God, strengthen them. And I am praying that God, this revival will not pass them by. It will begin in their lives. It will, it will continue in their families. It will continue to the ends of the earth through them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, because God, you will indeed perfect your work in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we want to bless you. We exalt and we return to you all the glory. Thank you for your word that came to us this evening. My prayer is that God, you will help us to think about this word. As we return home, you will continue to brood this in our hearts and remind us of this truth. And I know that, Lord King of glory, you will kindle a fire that no man can quench in the name of Jesus. Our revival will break out in this assembly that no one can stop in the name of Jesus. And that God, this church, will, will grow to the glory and praise of your name. We have asked you for this revival. We are open to it, O oh God. Have your way and take all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.